Welcome to Screen Weens, the horribly sad episode. <laughs> yes, where we talk about the very, very famous film trilogy that uh, neither of us had gotten around to watching for s- several years. Uh, the Human Condition. You know, there's a lot of people I work with. And none of them knew what this movie series was. So, I mean, like, it, it's not when we say very, very famous, for like you got to be cinephiles. in the know, I guess. Yeah. yeah. If you're on, like, the movie Iceberg and you mostly just watch, like, stuff that comes out of, like, Hollywood and, like, not old films, you probably won't know what this is. If you're a little more knowledgeable on, like, film history, you've probably heard of this one. Uh yeah, I've been meaning to watch this for a long time. So and I, I picked up that Criterion mm-hmm. version, and they sent me two. They accidentally sent me two orders. If I had known it was from the director of uh, Harakiri, I probably would have watched it a little sooner. But I came real close, like, a year or so. I had it downloaded, and I was going to watch it, but then I, like, got distracted and daunted yeah. by the 10-hour runtime. But, uh, but, yeah, before we just get into... Pain and sadness. Um, have you done anything else this week? Yes, I got two kittens. Yes, I saw. Yes. Um, Sir? S- yeah, my mom named... That one's hers, and his name is Sir Greyfell Purs a lot. I just call him Sir, because it's usually like, Sir, Sir, what are you doing? Sir, stop. Because he's... <laughs> Cool. She also Grandma. calls him the spicy nugget because he is. That's kind of good. Yeah, I like that one. The <laughs> spicy more. nugget. She's kind of reverted to calling him nugget around the house. So it's like, all right, I like that one too. Uh, and then I've got my cat, which is like a gray tabby. And her name is Luna. So yeah, they are very nice. And I'm enjoying them. They're about a week with us now yesterday. So yeah. Thomas came in today. My foot's still broken, so I was already sitting in the office, and he's just like, is that Pop-Tart? I just hear him say. Yeah. I'm like, is there another cat in my house or something? And Dude, he walks I... in, and Pop-Tart's in front of him, he's like, what happened? <laughs> <laughs> like, Pop-Tart, I mean, maybe I just wasn't paying that close attention the last time I saw it, but he looks like at least twice as big as the last time I saw I mean, Pop-Tart, she's... Arch, uh, yeah. Um... Maybe we just feed cats too much, but I think cats deserve to be a little chunky. <laughs> She's I got mean, a little bit of a belly. <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of the people that gets mad at yeah. it, unless it's, like, clearly, like, yeah. too much. In which case... You know, Allie's kind of a unit, but he's he's at a, you know... Mm-hmm. He's been there. Like, it's not... It hasn't gone up and down. He's, he's spry. I feel it. I've, I've, like, maintained the same, like, body yeah. fat, like... I'll kind of go up and down in weight, but I generally kind of look the same. Yeah. No matter how much. There's some times where, like, my gut will hang out, like, a little bit too far, and I'll be like, oh, man. Like, I'm going to stop doing something. Yeah, yeah. I do the same thing. And, it was, you know, it's it's been really hard since I broke my foot because I haven't been able to do anything, so I have put on quite a few pounds. I'm like, Yeah. Because right before that, it, it keeps happening. Like, I'll start to lose weight. And then something will happen where I'm like, well, I can't work out or I can't do something. It's like, cool. Mm, yeah. But, you know, I'm also six foot eight. So, like, oh. I, nobody sees me as being bigger. I just look like a tall person. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> um, but, yeah. So, you got your cats and you showed them a Serbian film. No, oh. but because uh, I spent a lot of time out in the living room this week just because I was kind of keeping yeah. the cats in the mutually era or area. Do you still have a dog? No, uh, he passed away in January. I th- You probably told me that. I'm I, sorry, I forgot. Oh, you're all good. But yeah, uh, what's it called? Yeah, so then we watched uh, Puss in Boots, The Last Wish. Yeah, I saw you watch that. It was pretty all right. Yeah, it, I, mean, I really liked the choreography, and yeah. I mean, I like. Uh, I thought it was okay, yeah. but yeah, like I wasn't super into like any of the side characters, and I thought the villain, like uh, the wolf, was really cool. Yeah, uh, was that Patrick Mullaney as the John Mullaney? His, uh, oh, John Mullaney. Yeah. Yeah. The fuck did I? I don't Patrick know. Mulaney. Um. 
Yeah, that was John Mulaney. And that's why I like I like the villain because he's so paper thin and John Mulaney's just that's being John Mulaney. It's like, what the fuck is that? I, I think that movie's really good. I do not think it's as good as most people think it is. Yeah, like, no. say it is. I just... It's probably like... I would probably claim it's like the third best of the whole Shrek franchise, but that's not really saying. I that might much. even go as far as saying I probably like it the most, but I don't really like the Shrek franchise. Uh, I like that one, and I like Shrek Two. I guess. Yeah. I Shrek Two's probably better. Yeah, I really like Shrek Two. I I like Shrek One a whole lot. Might be nostalgia. I, I might just like fart jokes and Mike Myers. That's good. Fart jokes, classic. <laughs> but uh yeah I don't know it's uh how I feel about it that's fair I get it you know what we should do we should remake the human condition trilogy and Shrek animation <laughs> and Mike Myers plays Kaji yeah so well of course <laughs> who else would it's, yeah um so just put some boots anything else or just hanging out with the cats Hang out with the cats. I caught like bits. Oh, I rewatched The Brood because uh, I just kind of put it oh, on because cool. it was on a criteria. Still haven't seen it. Uh, I'll watch it. Yeah, it's it's good. Uh, I the first time I saw it, I was like, "Whoa!" And then the second time I saw it, I was like, "All right, it's all right." Uh, I really like the concept. Uh, I don't know if Cronenberg like. I I don't know. It's 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 pretty decent still. I I. Aside from the fly, it might be still my favorite Cronenberg that I've seen, uh, but I still need to see a few of them. But yeah, uh, I watched like half the Bench Warmers with. <laughs> I used to love that movie. I used to think when I was like younger, I thought it was the funniest movie in the world. Yeah, I watched it a lot as a kid because I watched a lot of those Adam Sandler, Happy Madison stuff when I was a kid. And watching it now, it was just like. It was like an anti-comedy, but it wasn't, like, intentional. Because <laughs> it's just like... Just, oh, my God. John Heater's character is, like, just a stupid quip machine. And it's like, ugh. And yeah, I didn't think... Rob Schneider's The Chad, for some reason. It's a really weird movie. I don't... I don't like it. Yeah, that sounds alright. <laughs> So, yeah, you had a great week of movies. Yes. Besides the... I mean, you spent 10 hours watching The Human Condition. Yes, I did. All right, I'm going to try to do these fast because I did watch a lot this week. Um, plus, we had an extra two days because mm -hmm. it was a late recording. I watched the... I think it was the day of the last recording. That night, we watched uh, Justice League, the new Justice mm -hmm. League Ruby movie. Mm -hmm. Ruby? Mm-hmm. Like R-W-B-Y. Mm -hmm. The Justice League? Mm-hmm. They have DC Comics uh, does Ruby Comics occasionally. Mm. There's been they did Ruby Justice League like a year and a half ago, and they're doing one right now. Um, yeah, just a horrendous movie. Horrendous, what? horrendous. Uh, yeah. How could that be? And anything you know, Joe and Pierre sense. like Ruby, and they also said it was bad. So yeah. Um, I finally got around to watching Dress to Kill, the De Palma mm -hmm. movie. Uh, have you seen that one? Mm -hmm. Okay, it's. It's gorgeous. It looks incredible. It has so many cool sequences. It is 43 years old, and it does have some questionable things. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's... I don't know if you know the twist in that movie, but... Um, no, I don't okay. think so. Well, then I won't give it away, but... Yeah, it's a, it's a twist that um, uh, has proliferated in, like, kind of horror movies since, mm -hmm. and it's not a very uh, good twist, and it, uh, in my opinion, actively harms real people in real life. Yeah. In the movie itself, I don't think it's that bad, and I think De Palma has more, like, tact than most when mm -hmm. doing um, a scenario like this, and I still overall really enjoyed the movie, but I think some of the third act's kind of lame, I think the, the finale's awesome, though. So, like, overall, really enjoyable. Just kind of, like... Kind of, I was kind of, like, doing this... Yeah. <laughs> um, went to the theater, saw How to Blow Up a Pipeline, um, which I was so surprised got a wide release. Um, 
It, uh, it's just a tutorial. I mean, it was like two years ago. I haven't read it, but it was, it's based on a book that's just like an essay mm -hmm. on why, like, one of the best forms of, like, uh, th uh fighting against climate change is to just blow up pipelines. <laughs> and this is like a fictionalized version of that where a group of people like meet and they decide to blow up a pipeline. And it, it literally is kind of like a tutorial. It's showing like exactly what the steps they take. And stuff. Oh, it's sick. It's an hmm. awesome movie. Um, and then the director of uh, Edge of Seventeen did a new movie finally uh, called... Uh, it's an adaptation of the old book Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret. Uh, Which is yeah. like 50 years old, mm -hmm. but I don't think he's ever gotten an adaptation. Yeah, I've, I've um, seen some spots for it around. Um, but uh, really good. You know, it's definitely... The, the director seems to make movies that are geared toward like exactly that age range, mm -hmm. but like res really respectfully. So it seems like this is for like tween girls, but like is not ever, like, talking down on them, which is nice. Yeah. Um, but Rachel McAdams plays the mom in that, mm -hmm. and she's so good. I think she's such a good actress. Yeah. I was like, I want to see her in everything. <laughs> um, I watched a movie called Sick, which was, like, a Paramount... No, it might have been a Peacock original or something like that. It was, uh, like, a home invasion, like, horror thriller thing based in the pandemic. Oh, yeah, it was like, there's the uh, I was like, that sounds so original up until you said that part. It was uh, really bland. Um, it was by the writer of the, one of the writers from the original Scream. I can't remember his name, but it's so fucking lame. Yeah. <laughs> it was boring. Watch Evil Bong 2. And that was, uh, that was what I was Twice expecting. Twice the fun, right? I was, that was what I was expecting when I watched the first Evil Bong movie. That movie is uh, <laughs> pretty horrendous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, oh. I'm just going to get on a roll and watch three after this. And I watched one. And I went, no, thank you. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. Uh, I watched a movie from 2007 called The TV Set. It's by Jake Kasten. It has David Duchovny. It has a bunch of people in it. Mm -hmm. It's about, like, he's, like, a, a writer and he's writing for, like, a TV pilot that he wants to be picked up. Mm -hmm. And it's about, like, you know, studio interference and how things are changed from the original, like, intent and vision. Yeah. Um, it's like a comedy slash drama, but it was fine. Like, I like the performances in quite a – performances in it quite a bit, but it's like – I don't think it's very funny, mm -hmm. and I don't really think it's very insightful. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Rewatch School of Rock. Classic. Gotta do that every once in a while. Movie's insanely good. I heard that they're uh, doing another reunion here soon. I hope so. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's twenty years this year, and I was like, I told Tina Tay that. She's like, what? Yeah. You <laughs> um, watched the last reunion they did on YouTube. Yeah. It's a classic. Yeah. Um, I watched a movie called Kidnapped, which I had heard good things about. It's from like twenty ten. It's another like kind of home invasion movie, mm -hmm. um, but like kind of just generic. I had heard it. I wanted to watch something like really heart pumping and gross and like there are some gross scenes but not gross in like the fun way mm. just kind of gross and like the ah, that sexual assault cool that's not mm. what i want to watch um yeah. but they're they do this thing twice where they um kind of like how de palma occasionally does like split shots mm -hmm. um and he'll have like three shots going on they'll do two split shots of two separate scenes going on at the same time at different places Mm -hmm. And the first one's just, like, this little one of them, like, hiding in a room and the other guys are outside the room, like, banging on the door. But the second one is, like, the dad's getting back. Um, he's driving back to the house with one of the assailants and the daughter's fighting back with the other one. And it's, like, this... It's probably, like, three or four minutes of them doing, like, separate things. But then it eventually they meet up and the cameras, like, pan into each other and make one oh, shot. Nice. And it's, like, a really fun sequence. I think that, like... Is worth the watch just for that sequence. Mm -hmm. um, and oh god, I watched so much. I watched Bo is Afraid. Oh, how was it? It was okay. It was like probably about as much as I enjoyed Midsommar. I like this one. I think it's funny at times. I think it's like pretty fun. Um, I think Joaquin Phoenix is really good in it. But I feel like like an hour in, we've gotten as deep as we want to go with the themes of the movie, and it just kind of feels like it repeats itself after that a little bit. 
Okay. Um, Hinatea really liked it. Most of the people I've talked to have really liked it. It's just kind of like, I didn't, I didn't get it. I, uh, no, I did get it. I didn't get why people liked it as much oh, as yeah. they did. Me and Hinatea went to one of the Monday mystery movies, Regal, mm-hmm. that wasn't out yet. And we saw Robert Rodriguez's Hypnotic. Oh, haven't heard of that one. Uh, it's it's really dumb. Is it like a, one of his kids' movies? No, it's like a rated R. It's like a thriller. Ben Affleck's going after his daughter's missing, and she's he's what? trying to find who took her. And like there are people in the world that can hypnotize you to do things. It's mm-hmm. so du- it actually feels like Grown Up Spy Kids. Probably, mm-hmm. I had a lot of fun with it, but it's maybe the dumbest movie I've seen all year. Ah, I see. And that's, I've seen Hope's Exorcist. Um, we watched a movie called Morbid, which was like an hour long horror movie we found on Tubi TV. So, you know, obviously it was going to be garbage, but it's about like a girl goes to Japan and brings back a weird game and they play it. And it's like, oh God, oh, the big, the game is making us see things. Oh. Yeah, very bad. Um, then we did our classic thing. Me and Pierre watched another uh, random OVA. Mm-hmm. Um, we watched this one called Special Duty Combat Unit Shinesman, which is like uh, kind of a spoof or parody on like Super Sentai stuff. Mm-hmm. But they're all um, like businessmen uh, and they all work in this office building and they're all in different departments. But they're secretly funded by like um, one of the higher ups at the company. It's like we also have a superhero task force. It's only like two episodes. It was just a little OVA, but it's great. It's mm-hmm. really fun. It's really stupid. Hmm. Almost there. Uh, we watched a movie called Followers last night, which is a found footage movie about this like social media influencer who is trying to get footage of a ghost to you know make him more popular. Um, hey yo, I got to go. Hey yo. Um, you know it was bad. But it wasn't as bad as I was expecting. Like, structurally, there's some interesting stuff. And it, I think it keeps a, a good pace that it never, like, is too bogged down. But it's, like, stupid and um, mm-hmm. bad. <laughs> but, like, I was expecting the worst. And I'm like, oh, that was not bad. Um, and then today is Star Wars Day. It's May the 4th. Uh, as of us recording this, there is a new season of Visions that came out today. Um, mm-hmm. So me and Pierre watched all of those a couple hours ago. And, um, yeah, I think overall, I think it's slightly less good than the first season. I think there were more highs in the first season. I think there were two in the first season that I wasn't a huge fan of. In this one... I'd say maybe there's only one, but none of them really reach the same heights. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's some, there's some dope ones, definitely. Mm -hmm. And I do like the dip, like the first season was all like anime inspired, and this one has like animation studios from like all over the place. It has like three stop motion ones. Mm. Um, nice. But yeah. Uh, yes. 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 Also, we watched a show called Jury Duty, which is, uh, your mom would love it. I don't know anything about your mom, but it's uh, it's like a freebie show, um, and it's about a jury duty, but everyone's an actor except one guy, <laughs> and they go through this like whole trial. It's like eight episodes because they and it's mostly just the him like do, they're doing shenanigans pretty much. <laughs> um, James Marsden's in it, and he plays himself, but is like a dickhead, <laughs> and the guy's like, man. The the main character, the guy who's not an actor, he's, like, obsessed with the movie uh, Sex Drive, which James Marsden is in. And he, like, has a DVD copy. He's like, would you please assign this for me? <laughs> Weird. <laughs> then they're like, there's so many things that they're, like, just weren't anticipating, but the guy's just, like, he's just, like, a really nice guy. So then you're kind of rooting for him and stuff. It's, mm. it's a fun show. Hmm. Uh, yes, that is what I watched, that is what I did, that is what I danced. Let's see if we have questions from Pierre. Questions from Pierre. What is the best way to start a story? Jump right in. 
In a hole, there lived a hobbit. <laughs> It's a pretty good one. I think I think like jump cuts into like just action or some or a scene even just anything. I I think are nice. Um, I'm okay with yeah, you know, just like more somber, like slow starts as well. But I think it just depends on the kind of tone you want for your story that yeah. you're writing or making. I was gonna say every story is different and requires a kind of different type of beginning. Yeah. So whatever works best for the individual story. Yeah, I think it. Yeah, it just depends. Mm -hmm. Question two. When has a character you like done something you absolutely hated? Mm, well, I mean, there's probably an example of that in like, today's episode. Yeah, we'll be talking about that later. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, there's, there's tons of examples. Like, because, I mean, most of the characters I like are kind of imperfect. Yeah. Uh... I would probably say the one that sticks out the most to me, because I really like this character. I think it's, like, a pivotal piece of his character, like, in his arc. Like, spoilers, minor spoilers for, like, uh, Berserk's manga, like, past the Golden Age and past Conviction. Um, there's a point where, like, Guts in a Rage, like, bites Casca's, like, breasts... And it's like, it, yeah, I don't, obviously I don't like that part, mm -hmm. but it does add like an interesting layer to the series because like the whole rest of this, because this is like in her uh, like child catatonic state mm -hmm. that she's in because he's like saves her and is kind of taking her around and then he ends up like, so he's got like a bunch of the demons influence him and stuff and he kind of like gives into it for a moment and like attacks her and then like from that moment on she wants nothing to do with him even like into like current and stuff at least as far as I've read so mm. it's like obviously I don't like that choice coming from that character because it's like <sighs> it's like what the fuck bro yeah but yeah I don't know probably that I mean I feel like most of the things I would say are just like pivotal to like a character like, I hate that Anakin turned evil. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like, but I'm like, that's, you don't get the story without that. I hate that. that Darth Vader redeemed himself. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. It's a good moment. I hate that Palpatine returned. There we yes. go. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, yeah. There. We'll say that. And question three. I think all writers should direct as well. It's their story. Surely they know how it should play out, right? No. Yeah, no. No. I think people can write incredibly, and I think there are some directors that can't write for shit, you know? Yeah. And a lot of writers probably can't write for shit, but you you need different pieces of this puzzle. Yeah. And some writers can't fill up that puzzle, and that's okay. You know? yeah. I'd probably encourage most writers, like, if they want to, to try it out yeah. at least once. But No, absolutely. They're welcome to, but they shouldn't. <laughs> That's not like, yeah, they should. Definitely. You should. No, because, I mean, directing directing's more than just adapting the story based off of, like, the vision in your head. Because, I mean, it's also, like, the captain of the ship. You got to, like, understand the ins and outs and what you need. And yeah. you got to run a tight schedule. And You also have to be able to, like, talk to people. Yeah. And, like... You know, work with people. There's a whole different thing. Very with, you stressful. write something and you know exactly how everything's going to play out. You see that because it's written and you decide mm -hmm. how everything works. Yeah. And a director has to take that vision and be like, okay, how am I going to get this person to act like this? Yeah, writers are often different personality types. They're usually people who like being cramped or shut in a like dark room and not always but a lot of them are kind of antisocial so yeah. it's like they're not good with people skills or time management necessarily yeah. so it's like yeah you know kind of depends but yeah no definitely not not every writer should uh, adapt their story because they don't know then you get just weird adaptations with weird editing and weird yeah it's a whole mess that was it, right? That was the third question. That was the third question. Thank you, Pierre, for the questions, as always. Yes, thank you. At this time, let's talk about the Human Condition trilogy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's just a film. It just depends on the place it plays. <laughs> um, I'd prop. 
I mean, it's the same way that it's one film is like the Lord of the Rings. One, it's like one story. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Human Condition One, No Greater Love from 1959, which is the longest one. Yes. Um. Yeah. How did you watch these movies? Did you like? Watch just one a day, or did you split them up? Uh, I watched. I watched one a day, so uh, I was going. What to, are you doing, you little monster? I was going to binge watch them on Monday, and hey, then you stuck. Uh, you messaged me and let me know that uh, our normal recording day wasn't going to work. So I was like, "Oh, cool!" So then I ended up just watching the first one that night, and then the next day I watched the second one, and then. I watched the third one at, like, 6.30 this morning, so. Nice way to start your morning. Holy fuck. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, it was quite a start to the day. Jesus. Um, so, yeah. So, Masaki Kobayashi, there was a book called The Human Condition mm -hmm. um, that was, like, semi-autobiographical by... I'm going to check the writer's name in a second. But... Masaki Kobayashi read it. It came out in 1958 and said, holy shit, this is just like my life. Because uh, he was also in the war. Mm -hmm. He also had, like, very similar things happen to him. So he immediately was like, I, I need to read this. <laughs> or I need to make this into a movie. Uh, Junpei Gomikawa is the guy who wrote the original. And I was like, I should read the original. It doesn't have an English translation. 60 years later? What the fuck? I guess, I guess maybe I could... I don't think it's right, but I can see why, I guess. Because I imagine fucking in the 60s, there weren't a whole ton of Americans who were like, you know, why don't we read a, like, kind of somewhat sympathetic, anti-war, uh, mm -hmm. sentimental, like, book from, like, one of our World War II enemies. Yeah. Um, the studio that produced this uh, really did not want to. <laughs> because it's yeah. pretty, you know... Uh, a pretty big in indictment on, you know, the Japanese imperial war machine that was existing at the time. Yes. Um, and Kobayashi's like, I will quit if you don't. <laughs> That's literally just gave him a stalemate. He's like, I'm going well, to do this or yeah. I will quit. <laughs> Glad he did. I am uh, too. Yeah. Um, Tatsuya Nakadai, uh, mm -hmm. I think is the main guy in it. He's the main character in Harakiri as well. Yeah, um, he, and this one... He, he's also... Is he the one with the gun in Yojimbo? I think so. And he's yeah. also uh, the old king in Ron. That's right. That's uh, right. He's also the detective in High and Low. Oh. Yeah. Okay. He's incredible. Yeah. He's so good. He is. He's like the best. Uh, this was his first lead. Really? Yeah. He was in two of Masaki Kobayashi's previous films, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and Kobayashi specifically wanted him. Um, and yeah, he said it was like his first lead. And apparently it was pretty pretty rough. Uh, I, I can Especially because, you know, a lot of the action um, at this time was harder to get. So, like, a lot of the punches you see, they're just actually punching him. Mm -hmm. uh, he's, he's apparently especially was pretty... Uh, it was pretty rough for the final scene in the third because he's just laying there for quite a bit of time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. And then the next year after the third movie, he would do Harakiri. That's insane. Following up Human Condition 3 with Harakiri. It's like, I gotta show how far back this shit goes. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> um... <laughs> But, yeah, what else was I going to say? Oh, I did read, and obviously I'm not going to, this was 60 years ago, but um, the, all the Chinese um, in the movie is like none of the actors, I don't think any of them were Chinese and none of them knew Chinese. Uh, so they all just like were written phonetically in Japanese for people to read. And I think it sounds like pretty good. Obviously, I don't speak Mandarin, so yeah. I don't. No, but, uh, uh, and it, and they were like, and we just hired just any non like Japanese people to play the Russians. Just like any, any white people that are like that nah, Russian. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, which that's delving more into the third movie. But yeah, so this first movie, actually all three of these movies, we follow this guy named Kaji, mm -hmm. who is a nice guy. Yeah. 
a very sympathetic fellow. He basically um, uh, writes something that's a little on the leftist side, mm-hmm. so he gets... So he's basically granted with a, an opportunity where he's his work is offering to uh, exempt him from being drafted into the war, but he has to basically, like, go and... Uh, Improve, like, a mining colony, pretty much. Yeah. And he gets there, and it's like, oh... It's a POW labor camp. Well, at the time it wasn't. Well, yeah. Well, it's like, it's fine. I'm going to improve. And it's like two days later. It's yeah. like, hey, we're sending you 600 POWs and you're going to be in charge. He's like, um, no. Yeah. Like, you better. And also, uh, he brings his wife with him. Yeah. Uh, the whole, like, first leg of the film is... Him, uh... Michiko! Yeah. Him and his wife, Michiko, basically, like... She wants to be with him, but he realizes, like, he's more than likely just gonna be shipped out into the war, and he's like, well, I don't... I don't want to, like, be an anchor for her when I can't actually be an anchor mm-hmm. for her. But then, uh... You know, he gets the news that he can not go to war, and his friend basically, like... Pushes him into it before he leaves for war. It's like, hey, you two, go live together. Go live a happy life. Uh, and so they try. Gosh, do they try. But, yeah. So he ends up running this mining facility with a 600 POWs. And uh, they're constantly like, we need worker productivity to be driven up. And they're trying to encourage, like the worst methods of obtaining that, just through brute force and intimidation. Uh, and yeah. Uh, basically, he spends the whole movie just trying to, like, gain the trust of, like, the POWs and, like, trying to keep them from escaping. And, uh, meanwhile, like, everyone above him and around him is, like, just banking everything on trying to get him to fail. Yeah. Uh, and it's he has the one guy that's kind of on his side that works with him. I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah. And he also is, like, wary of his ways, but, like, he's willing to try it at least. Yeah. No, I thought he was a, a good foil for the main character because he's, like... Okishima. Yeah, because yeah. he's, you know... He's not as pure as our main character. Like, he's obviously willing to resort to, like, give in to his fear and like resort to like brutality when he thinks it's necessary if it'll like save his skin whereas like our main character really isn't there yet but uh you can tell that when the main character is around he does try to like remind himself and bring himself down to like a normal level where it's like all right i'm not good try not to but obviously like the pressure kind of increases as him over his duration of the story and he ends up he ends up leaving for a little bit he gets like sent to like a conference Tatsuya Nakada is still alive is he really? he is he's 90 yes we can get him on the market there's still a chance Tatsuya we love you (laughs) but uh yeah so uh yeah he basically just kind of I don't know. There's so much to talk about because so this first much. part is c- probably like the most segmented from the rest of the movie because it it's setting and mm-hmm. kind of like, you know, it's his humble beginnings as a character. So he's a vastly kind of different character in the first one as opposed to like kind of his the second one. And yeah. then the third, like it's definitely like it's a pretty, I guess, different change between one and two, but he's definitely a different character between two and three. And you can kind of yeah. see points where his he breaks, you know. Mm. Not a very um fun movie. <laughs> well no. Definitely not. Uh yeah. Like it's kind of one of those movies I'm like, I don't even want to tell people what happens because I want you to go watch it, but most people aren't gonna watch this movie. No. I told my coworkers, I'm like, guys, I will let you borrow it. Please watch it. It's like the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and they said, nah I'm like, yeah, that's fair. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. I might get Hina Tay to watch it. I told her, she said she was interested after I said how much I enjoyed it. Um, and I told her we should watch Harakiri first, because it's two hours, and, yeah, you know, good, similar storytelling. A good types. sampler. <laughs> oh, darn. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> so if she likes that, then I'm like, okay, then then you can watch the nine and a half hour long movie. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, I feel like, you know, he, the whole movie, he just slowly is unraveling as a man and been mm-hmm. trying to do the right thing, but he also doesn't know what the right thing is most of the time. Um, but one of the main guys that he's the befriended, what's, do you remember that guy's name? The one, the, the leader or no, not the leader. Um, Pop Tart. Uh, which guy? Well, he dies at the end. <laughs> oh, Akira? No. I think it starts with a K. Okay. Anyway, um, he befriend he he tries to befriend them. They don't really want to be his friend, um, but one of them is, uh, you know, he wants to escape, he wants to get out, but he also falls in love with um, one of the, like, prostitutes that work there. Because one of the big plot points in this movie is there's, like, a like a, a brothel that's kind of there. It's, like, yeah. 30 women live there, and they're like, oh, the the prisoners are will work better if you just send these women in. He's like, I'm not gonna do that. And they're like, you're better. And he's like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Pop Dart's claws are getting into you. <laughs> that they are. Um, but they like kind of fall in love, and he then he's like more hesitant to escape because he doesn't want to escape without her. Um, but after a couple of prison breaks, which are orchestrated by like one of his uh, Chen, I think is mm-hmm. the the guy that works for him. Um, yeah, and there's a Korean guy who I cannot remember his name, who's like. Uh, paying, like, he's getting money for people escaping. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to help as many people escape. He's eventually caught. um, And Chen dies. How does Chen die? Uh, Chen basically runs into the electrical fence when they were trying to, like, snipe him as they were trying to escape. Yeah, because he he was was fine. They were like, you need to do one more because they were going to do a kind of escape attempt. Uh, They were going to thwart it and be like, look how good we are. Then try to make Kaji look bad. Yeah. Um, And Chen's like, I can't do this. And he was going to warn them, but... He can't. It's raining. Nobody can hear him. So he just runs into the fence. Mm-hmm. Um, and then another person, this, this like other group of people are working in like just mining in the middle of the day. And mm-hmm. one of the, one of the like main antagonists of this first film is like whipping them. And this yeah. m- other guy, the one that I cannot remember his name, like throws a rock at him or like he stops him. He grabs the whip and he like is like, I'm going to hit you. And then they all run off and then they're tried for uh, attempting to escape. And they're like, we weren't, we weren't escaping. We were in the combat. There was nowhere to run. We couldn't get out. This was not an escape attempt. We were simply running from the guy that was hitting us. Escape from discipline. Yeah. Um, but they want to make an example. So the gov- the military comes back and they're going to execute them. Mm. And Kaji has a kind of final encounter with this old man who he's been kind of befriending from, who's the leader of the POW camp. And he's like, you know, this is where you either become a man or a monster. Like, this is where you prove yourself to either be our friend or to be our enemy. Um, so Kaji is like st- at his home with his wife. And he's like, I gotta, I gotta break him out. And she's like, don't, what the fuck? You're not going to just break him out. This is not a good idea. Like mm-hmm. she's like, don't do this. You're going to throw their lives away and your life away. Like, don't do this. Um, and he doesn't. And then the next day, the beheading start and all the prisoners of war are watching mm-hmm. and he's watching and there's seven people that escape, and they're going to behead them all. But the third one is this guy. I want to say it was K A O. Um, yeah, I'm pulling up the first one. Let's see if I can find it. Ko, maybe it was Ko. Uh, but anyway, he is beheaded, and right before he is, he like yeah, it tells was, it was Ko. Ko, yeah, Ko tells Kaji like, "You're evil. I hate you, pretty much." Yeah, and. Kaji's like, that's fair. <laughs> um, but after that, Kaji's like, enough. We cannot do this anymore. So then the guy with the sword's like, okay, I'm going to cut your head off then. He's like, what the fuck? 
<laughs> and so he starts chasing them, and then all the prisoners of war, because they're like 500 and they're all out, they're like, stop! Stop! Yeah. Um, and, you know, the military's like, well, maybe we shouldn't start a riot here. Like, we could probably gun them all down. Might, we have the guns. Bring down but, our, uh... Yeah, it's all a money thing. So they just kind of let them off. They decide not to. Yeah. And then they take Kaji for. 20 days. 20 days? I was like, a month, though. They, I, they don't, I don't think they specify in this one, but in the second one, they, <clears throat> they do specify that he had been taken for 20 days in his wife's letter to, like, his sergeant or whatever. And they just beat the shit out of him and torture him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the guy's like, okay, I'm going to let you go, but I'll remember I'll always be one step ahead of you and watching you. And he's like, oh, my God, I'm free. And he runs home. He's so happy. And then he gets back, and his boss is like, here you go. Yeah. And it's a summons to go to the war. So he goes to his wife, and he's like, we got one more day to spend with each other. And it kind of ends there. Also, uh, the guy who is getting money for, uh, like, the prisoners escaping is also getting his new position. Yeah, which was his old position. Or, yeah, yeah. his old position. And Okishima's like, go tell him. He's like, and then he tells him that uh, the prisoners, or... Some of them had escaped, including uh, Shen. So. Yeah, which or is, not Shen. Uh, old man, yeah. whatever his name was, which he had been told was killed before. So he's like, yes, he got out. Hey, Good wow. for him. I hope you're doing okay. Yeah. He's like, I hope they all escape. And he's like, I like the part where he's like, oh, I was just about to go over there and beat the shit out of that guy. Yeah, but you know, I won't do that now. <laughs> yeah. Totally still should have done that. Yeah. Well... Wouldn't have been good for him, but would have been very cathartic. <laughs> but, yep. So he then, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know why he has to go to the brothel for some reason. Uh, and then, uh, he was just walking through town. He doesn't go directly to the brothel. Oh, she, okay. she sees him in town. She's like, evil, devil. Yeah, Ko, Ko's a uh, lover who was going to yeah. escape with what him. Her name? There's so many characters. Yeah, there are a lot of And characters. I will say, I think they all... are. They're all so good, I will say. Yeah. I think they're all fleshed out. It's just like now, talking about it, I'm like, oh god, I don't remember their names. I can, I can remember, like, who they were and what they what role they served and stuff. But yeah, I, I could not tell you most of their names. Uh, but yeah, she basically, like chases him out of town and he ends up like running into his wife like down by like some gravel pits and, yeah they end up like running into each other's arms and he explains the whole thing to her meanwhile she's like in the background chasing him like calling him a Japanese devil and they walk away into the sunset while she follows behind and that's how the movie ends for now for now no. but um yeah, I think this movie's incredible. Yeah. I we can rate them if you want, but my rating is the same for all three. No, oh, is so, it? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, I mean we can save it for the end if you sure. want. Sure. Hello. But yeah, no greater love. Yeah. Very it's good. Incredible movie. Yeah. Um You liked it though? It may have been the best thing I've ever watched. It the was- first one? I mean, or as talking? a whole, but yes, the first. Okay, are we I, saying I, I saw. That? I was. I finished. I finished the first one, and I was like, I kind of looked over at my Amar Bergman set, and I was like, "Scenes from a Marriage." You might need to scoot over. <laughs> like, so I guess I'll just say it now because you said that. But I finished the third one, and I think I was like, I think that's the best movie I've ever seen. Yeah, I, I can't tell. Like, yeah, I almost rewatched the third one today. To like solidify, but I'm like, I kind of just want to rewatch all of them again. Yeah, so do I. And I kind of want to watch them all in one day. Like, I want to, I would need like a weekend though to kind of recuperate because I finished that third one and I went to work the next day. I'm like, oh God. (laughs) Yeah, I was also kind of there. And this, these movies, especially like today, they're kind of like scary because like, 
it's kind of like looking down the barrel that we're like looking down in real life. Cause like, I feel like America in 2023, we're not too far from this type of scenario. Yeah. Like, but, but then you look at history and it's like, I, the thing is, I don't think we've ever not been right there. <laughs> that is yeah. true. It's like you want to think like, oh, it was no. good like 10 years ago. No, it wasn't. No. I, and I'm fully aware yeah. of that, but, uh, it seems like we've been living in a bubble, mm-hmm. like post World War II, at least over here in the West. Yeah, and it's like that bubble's real due to burst here soon, because we, I mean, we've got so many new war toys that we haven't played with on the global scale. Not that I uh, personally, I'm anti-war, <laughs> but obviously the elites feel otherwise because they don't have to participate in it. Uh, yeah, but. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, fuck. I think it was yesterday. The Kremlin was fucking uh, bombed, and it's like, oh. Yeah. Scary. That's why everyone should watch this movie. Yes. It, anyway. it on- Honestly, they should show this in schools. I, like, I would love if they showed, like, World War Two movies with, like, each, like, some of the big participating mm-hmm. countries that World War Two, like each, because I'm sure everyone, every country that makes fucking film has made a World War Two movie. Yeah, I've, there's some really um, post World War Two like German movies that I've heard really good things about. I can't think of any right now, but mm. you know they're probably even more of an indictment on their country. Probably, you know. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie, this series, holy shit. Um, but the second one, Road to Eternity. Mm-hmm. What a sick ass title, I will say. Um, but yeah, it starts with him already in, uh, he's already like a soldier. Um, and he's at his camp and he's like training. Um, this one's rough. Rough yeah. to watch. Uh, they're all rough to watch, but, uh, indeed, you know, it's saddening consistently um yeah. but this one he's like he's a pretty good soldier too like he's good at doing things like he's a good yeah they fighter and stuff telling him it's like if you didn't have such a big mouth or big ideas yeah. you'd be the perfect soldier yeah. and it's like wow and <laughs> Bob die you can't stop doing it you and your <laughs> it's okay it hasn't it hasn't froze yet we're good okay. um but yeah they they think he would be like this great soldier, and some of his like captains are even like, just keep him on the on the track to go up because as soon as he gets more power, he'll he'll drop this kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And Kaji, for the most part, I do think still stays pretty like he tries to stay a good person no, throughout the ab- whole trilogy, absolutely. and he slips, but it's like it's kind of so. <sighs> I mean, it's, it's weird. It's the same way I think of like Schindler's List. Do you remember I talked about that? And I said like at its core, there's a lot of hope ingrained into the movie. And I think that's also the case in here because Kaji does bad things and he's constantly around bad things. But there's this like unending like need to try to be better. And he tries to claw his way back up mm-hmm. and he does the wrong thing. Like in the first one. He waited three times while these people were beheaded before he finally was like, I need to stop this, you know? Yeah. Um, in the second one, he doesn't do anything. There's this character that he's kind of training. He's a, like, kind of typical nerd guy. He cannot do anything, but, you know, he was drafted, so he's stuck here. And they humiliate him in front of everyone because he didn't do this, like, multi-mile, like, hike thing properly. Mm -hmm. And he had to be, like, carried back. Mm -hmm. And they completely humiliate him, so he fucking kills himself. That scene's horrifying because he tries to kill himself twice and he fails and he's like maybe this is a sign that i should live and he like gets up to try to you know live again and the gun goes off and he dies Mm -hmm. and it's like why would you do that to me it's like why it's like so much more heartbreaking than if he had just killed himself the second it's sad it would have still been heartbreaking but yeah the second his character was introduced i was like i saw i saw the writing on the wall i was like so this is where uh, Full Metal, uh, not Alchemist, Jacket, Jacket, <laughs> uh, 
got private pile and obviously like private piles is his own like mm-hmm. i'm not saying it's like redundant of this movie yeah. or copying this movie to a t but you could tell that the inspiration was probably yeah. stemmed from this unless i haven't read i don't know if i'm sure full metal jacket's based on a book because like that was stanley kubrick's whole mo was taking a book and going i can do this better and then making it into a movie because uh, he always adapts a book Unless you're talking about, like, Killer's Kiss or Fear and Desire. But he always adapts a book, and he never fucking sticks to it. I mean, look at, uh, like, Doctor Shining. Strange Love yeah. versus, uh... Oh, yeah. That... What? Um... Oh, it's, like, right on the tip of my tongue. Notice, no? Uh, Failsafe. Failsafe, yeah. yeah. Uh, or The Shining is probably, yeah. like, the more obvious example, but... Yeah, it's, like... It doesn't stick close to the source material at all. And I think it works for most of his films. And I, like but... I said, I've always said, I think, if you're going to adapt something, you can either be super close. Like, this movie is apparently extremely close mm-hmm. to the point that Masaki Kobayashi had a copy of the book on him at all times. And, like, during scenes, he'd be, like, looking at him and be like, is this right? And then he'd also go, like, the script. He'd look at the script and be like, I feel like this scene from the book needs to be in here. I think we can add it. And then he'd add it, and he'd be like, okay, guys, you got a data. <laughs> Remember your lines, and we'll record this tomorrow. No, oh, man. Yeah. But the the author of the book was like, yeah, it's great, because it's, like, just my book. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. So that one guy kills himself, and then... And then Kaji immediately is like, you guys need to stop this guy. He did this. And they're like, well, what if we don't? He's like... Then I'll take care of him. Like, what the fuck? He's like, what are you saying? He's like, I'll, I'll take, take care of it. <laughs> yeah, he's like, justice needs to be served here. I mean, he doesn't put it like that, but he's like, shit needs to happen here, and you're not going to make it happen. I'll make it happen. Yeah. And they're like, we'll pretend we didn't hear that. Yeah. He's like, well, tell him that if he's anywhere near me, he's getting fucked up. <laughs> like, and then there's also a character he meets... Is it Shinjo? Shin? I don't think it's Shinji. Shinzo? Hold on. I'm trying to remember the character. Um. Uh. Yeah. Shinjo. The one he meets in uh, the hospital, right? No, that's uh, Shinjo. Is the character that uh, he he deserves under suspicion? Yeah. He. His brother was a communist, so. Mm -hmm. Uh, and his sister or his his girlfriend sold him out because his yeah. brother was a communist. Um, so he gets sent here, and he's a private, but he's been in like there for like five years or something, mm-hmm. um, because nobody wants to give him any power because they suspect he's also a communist. Yeah. So he's like really angry. <laughs> Papa, <laughs> special guest Papa. Yeah. Oh, gonna hit the camera again. <laughs> You're the worst. I love you. <laughs> you little freak. Yes, good. Lay there. Good job. Um, but yeah, Shinjo befriends him. And um, after this guy dies, he's like, I'm going to leave. And he like wants to. And they're thinking about it. But um, there's a fire. I don't remember how the fire. I think it might just be like a fire. I can't remember if something uh, happens. <sighs> But there's yeah, a it's, fire. It's starting it's to feeling, spread like yeah. pretty badly, and they're like trying to combat it. But they're like, "No, we got to retreat." And you just suddenly see Shinjo just book it. He's just fucking running. And uh, the guy that was responsible for the nerd's death—I can't remember the nerd's name—and I even feel bad for calling him the nerd. But the guy who died, uh, the guy who had humiliated him. He starts running after him. So Kaji starts running too. And they're both like seemingly like to other people, it looks like they're kind of running after him together. Mm -hmm. But Kaji's like trying to stop this guy. Because if this guy catches Shinjo, Shinjo's going to die probably. And if he catches Shinjo, he can like, oh, oh, whoops. Or he can keep him safe. Um, And they're running through like swamp, swamp lands. Um, And Kaji just like tackles the dude into like this cold, gross swamp water. Mm-hmm. And he gets out and the other guy's like drowning. And he's like, okay, I'm going to help you out if you uh, if you say that you killed him. Um, and he's like, okay, okay. And he pulls him out. But then they both get like dragged back in. They both fall back in. Yeah, because um, he like tries to fight him when he gets yeah. out or roll over or something. Yeah. And so they both fall back in yeah. and he drags them both out and then he wakes up and he's like in a hospital bed and the other guy died. Yep. Um, and then from there, we're done with, like, that part. 
we don't see that camp anymore. He eventually joins up with a different unit. Um, yeah. But he, during this hospital visit, he meets someone else. I need to remember his name. He meets a cool nurse. Oh, uh, yeah. We do, I forgot, in the camp, Michigo travels all the way to visit him. And one of the most beautiful lines in this entire trilogy is like, can you go stand by the, the window? Uh, I want to see you like illuminated by the moonlight. I need to like, burn the vision of you into my mind so mm. I can always see you kind of thing. I'm like, what the fuck? Yeah. And that's the last time we see Michiko pretty much. We yeah. see her briefly in the third one in like a scene. Yeah. Well, they have their non-goodbye goodbye scene where the next morning basically like it seems like she's waiting for him to come like escort her out of there but he shows up and he's basically like they're making me like they're just mandatory training. They're refusing yeah. to let me take you out of here. And yeah, they have they have trouble parting because deep down inside they worry: Is this going to be the last time I I see my significant other? Yeah, yeah. And it's sad. But yep. So Kaji then. I'm trying to remember what exactly happens. Well, he meets well, at the hospital. Oh, yeah, he, meets the he meets the meets, guy yeah. um, Can't think of his name. who is also like pretty critical of the war, mm-hmm. and he's kind of like, "I'm just hanging out at the hospital." Yep. But they eventually ship him off, and he's like, "I'll see you soon. Hopefully, we'll see each other again." Yeah. If two, if people want it enough, they'll meet again. Yeah. Which we will see him again. Um, and then Kaji is eventually like kind of. He's not even, like, flirt. He's just kind of hanging out with the nurse. Um, and the, like, head nurse comes in and she's like, Ah, I'm the head nurse. I'm evil. Evil. She's like, you two and, are fucking. And yeah. he's like, we're not. I yeah. just asked her for help. And he's like, you're giving her orders. That's even worse. Yeah. So they send her into, like, the front lines as, like, a field medic. And they send him to another unit. Um, yeah, good stuff. Yeah, they send... Yeah. And then he's in another unit. <laughs> and he's trying to survive, and they're fighting people, and he's trying to keep people alive kind of thing. Mm. Um, and he it becomes a... Man, this movie... There's so much that happens in these nine hours. Yeah. And no. they also do give you a reprieve in the middle, and because each part... There's six parts. Um, mm. And then this fourth part, the second part of this one, um, he becomes like a lieutenant or kind of thing, or a pri- I can't remember what. Yeah, he's basically... Lieutenant, I think they say. Yeah, they give him like uh, his own group of uh, like people to basically take charge of. But he's like, alright, I'll do it, but under one stipulation, you gotta separate them from like the people who have been here for a couple of years, because like the senior vets are like I mean obviously it's kind of like the fucking dazed and confused Mm -hmm. uh, mentality just in the military where it's like oh you know we're the seniors we gotta fucking pick on the freshmen and make their lives living hell Uh, because it's a cycle you know it happened to them and now it's their turn to be the fucking people who give the beatings out and shit and you know they take too much uh, sadistic joy in it Mm -hmm. To the point where it's very, very... I mean, so that kind of behavior is always concerning, but especially concerning here. Uh, So, all of the vets who are, like, extremely just upset at the fact that, like, it's like, oh, they take personal offense to the fact that, like, Kaji's like, no, like, I don't want them around you. So, they're like, oh, this is going to be, like, the easy crew. They get, like, the easy way through you know, boot camp and stuff. And he makes a point that it's like a lot of the people that he is training are older and they aren't able to like endure a lot of the stuff that like he would have been able to endure when he was like first uh, going through uh, like recruitment and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, but they beat the shit out of him. Uh, There's one guy who was in his like uh, training days who's there and he, he, it's not like the guy who was with him. This is one of the guys who had to get carted back. And pretty sure it's the guy who went in and was like, 
asking Michigo to like write his wife, right? I think so. Yeah. Well, it might have been. And it's like two faced asshole, like because he yeah ends up shoving like his fucking sandal so far down Kaji's throat that he's like coughing up blood and shit, yeah, which also might, might have been during the beating, but yeah, it was like. He couldn't take it no, out. Don't like don't be rubbing against the microphone. Because <laughs> <laughs> he like uh, their high their higher rank guy comes in and is like sees that he's got a sandal in his mouth. He's like, take it out. And he's like, because mm. it's like jammed in yeah. there. Uh, and yeah, so he ends up training these guys, but once they get like a little, there's the one guy who gets like a little. They, like, steal his buttons or something, and he gets really upset about it, and then they end up punishing, like, the whole uh, squad. And uh, this guy's, like, complaining the whole time and talking about how it's unfair, and Kaji, basically. This is kind of, like, where you start to see a lot of the shift in his character as well, because he's, like, basically, like, hey, like, just get through it, endure it. Mm -hmm. When it's over, it'll be over. But this guy insists on continuing to, like... You know, make a scene. He ends up like bolting into the other room and trying to attack like some of the seniors. And uh, I think that results in basically uh, him. He's like, "All right, well, half of you are going off to a railroad camp where you'll fucking take care of that shit for a month, and then you'll come back here." Uh, and then Kaji finds out that when he does come back, he'll just be shipped off again because mm-hmm. they're like, "You're too much trouble, too critical." We can't have critical thinkers in the military. That just... That doesn't make any sense. Yeah, it goes completely against the chain of command. Uh, But yeah. So they end up... Half the crew ends up going. uh, And... It's, uh, I think, 28 members. I think it's only like five people that are left behind. Yeah, it's something like that. And uh, they end up... the facility they were at. Uh, is attacked like pretty shortly after they leave and yep. most people, like everyone from his unit dies. Yep. Uh, and he meets up with the veterans again who show up kind of thing. They're like, we're gonna fight him. So they get ready to fight this battle mm-hmm. and they all die. Pretty much. <laughs> like he survives like two other people. He saves one of the guys and everyone else dies and that's kind of how that movie ends. <laughs> yeah. Well, he ends up uh, the guy who put the, like, fucking sandal in his mouth ends up... They're in some trenches avoiding, like, tanks and stuff. And, uh, like, they're trying to keep quiet. And the one guy just goes completely delirious. And Kaji ends yeah, and up... tries to, like, hit him. Tries to kill them. Yeah. Because he thinks that they're the enemy. Because he's just completely... Shell-shocked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and Kaji ends up, ha- like, strangling him. Uh, on purpose, accidentally... At this point... Probably on purpose. Probably both. <laughs> yeah, pr- probably somewhere in the middle. I'm sure he was probably trying to choke him out. I don't think he was trying to take it that far. Probably, but uh, I was I was surprised. I didn't realize that's what was happening because when he was getting choked, like foam came out of his mouth, and I've never seen that in yeah, anything like, before. And I was like, does that happen? Is that like something they just did? To, that guy like, just crazy? Get it yeah. I thought he was like having a seizure or yeah. something. I was like, oh, man. But then it was like, oh, no, he he killed him. Because for a second, I was like, he died. Yeah. I thought he was going to be like, he's dead. I don't know what happened. But he was like, no, I killed him. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> so, yeah. And that's the end of uh, The Road to Eternity. Hardcore. Hardcore. Yeah, and I watched this, and I started the third one, and I'm like, I need to take a break. <laughs> yeah, I thought about trying to watch some of these back to back, but I, yeah, I was just like, I'd finish one and I'd be like, not even like necessarily that I was like so beaten down that I couldn't watch more. It was just like, it's a lot of content and I, I was enjoying kind of processing it. Cause I mean, there is a lot of like philosophy that's sprinkled in here. It, it's like one of the things that I really liked about uh, scenes from marriage is like, it's full of just fucking nuggets of wisdom Mm -hmm. although this is like more like wartime wisdom uh and just kind of observe i mean the human condition i mean (gasps) holy fuck right (laughs) i know right pretty genius i came up with that one you know not really (laughs) 
Um, yeah, the original title of this piece was going to be called Kaji's Fun Adventure. I'm pretty sure the name of this movie is, uh, let me see. Pretty sure it's Human Condition. I was really hoping they were going to have, like, it phonically spelled out on letterbox, but I'm just looking at a bunch of Japanese characters. So I cannot tell you what the original name of this movie is. It's not the human condition. It might be something that translates directly to that. But, <laughs> um, but yeah, let's talk about a soldier's prayer. Yeah. Heart wrenching stuff here. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty brutal. So most of the movie is him with a ragtag band of, uh, you know, other soldiers that have he meets up with. Um, and they're just kind of wandering. They're not even sure if the war is still going. They're not sure if it's done with. Mm-hmm. Um, Kaji's like, I kind of don't give a shit. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go home. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so his whole this one, he's just trying to get home. Um and throughout that, he meets, like, a couple of families, and he tries to take them with them, yeah, and they eat, like, poison mushrooms. And there, There's an assortment of tragedies that yeah, happens to the, the baby copious dies. amounts yeah. of civilians they gather throughout the movies. But, yeah, this first group, a lot of them starve to death, and then uh, this one mother gets really upset because, like, she basically goes over and she's like, give me some of that rice, because they've got a ration of rice, mm-hmm. and he's like... No, like, no. This, this rice is for everyone and we're saving it for like... Yeah, he says, we're either going to use it when we know we're going to leave or we know we're going to die. Yeah. Uh, and she's like, my baby's going to die. And he's like, your baby's like already dead. Like, there's no point in feeding it rice. Like, it, unsustainable. And she like goes over and immediately is like, it's dead! And it's like, well, see, the rice wouldn't have helped anything. <laughs> no, but... uh yeah, uh, it's pretty pretty hardcore, and then yeah, she, her and her the rest of her family end up eating poisonous mushrooms, and he's like, ah, and she's like, I don't want your fucking help. You've already doomed us. And it's like, that's one thing I will say about this trilogy. I get why it does it from like a narrative perspective, but there's a lot of like people who assign the blame solely to Kaji when it's like. He's, like, trying to help you guys, and it's, like, more the situation you guys should be upset at. Yeah. Or, like, any... Which he is also, like, the face of the blame because he is part of the soldiers. Like, he is part of the military. I think it makes sense in 2 and 3. I felt like there was a lot of... I get, like, hesitancy to trust him in the first one, but he there's some points where, like, he just kind of gets blamed for stuff where it's like... I don't don't know if he should necessarily saddle the whole blame for that. Mm -hmm. Definitely, like, he's... Uh, sort of uh, oh, what's the term I'm trying to think of like passive to a lot of it or seemingly so because it's like he's obviously running around a whole lot and the one scene I really like from the first one where he's like in the jail cell and he's pleading to him he's like I don't have any power I'm trying guys please but, but sometimes it's also easier to you know give put the blame on someone who's not going to hit you or kill you, you know? <laughs> yeah, that is true. But yeah, so they pretty much lose everybody from that group. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have, there is a prostitute that sticks with them for a while. Yeah, there's two. Yeah. And one of them dies. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the one takes like a kind of like has, starts to form a connection with uh, Kaji, at least somewhat of a connection. Yeah. Uh, she's talking about like, oh, you know, my sister's still out there and I'm going to go meet up with her and stuff. And oh, you know, as long as apparently as long as it seems like if I stick with you, I'll survive. Mm. Yeah, no, she. Yeah, it's rough. Yeah. They uh, go, they find a small little, like, abandoned house. They're like, well, let's kill this pig and eat him and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then they're surrounded by Manchurian, like, peasant soldiers. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's outside and she gets... Yeah, they they just kill her. And yeah. it's honestly, like, I'm I'm usually not disturbed by gore, but, like, 
her arm had a little bit of like gore where like it just her flesh like popped up. Yeah, the way they do like kind of flesh above because obviously it's on top of the skin yeah. um and it's obviously that but the way they do it looks it's pretty realistic. Yeah. So it's like, "Oh. Oh no." Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, ah, man. "Yikes." Yeah. Um and then they continue on. They kill all the soldiers. And they continue on. They eventually find like a village um, mm-hmm. full of people, uh, just mostly like women and some older men. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, "Let's stay here for a bit." Um, and they're like, "Yeah, you can, but uh, can you go f- steal some stuff for us?" Mm-hmm. And they steal some stuff, and they like uh, all the women there. Are, they a, a big thing in this trilogy they talk about is like human touch and like human love, and it's like. A lot of the women there have husbands, but like, we have no idea if we're ever going to see them again. We haven't been touched by anyone, so they they all have like sex, um, mm-hmm. except for Kaji, who's like, "I'm too good for this. I have a wife." Yeah, um, and there's a woman who's like, "Fuck you," you know, like yeah. I get it. You, I have a husband, but. I am waiting every day for him, and I'm starving. I don't know if I'm going to survive, and I sh- don't really think he's going to survive. <laughs> so it's like, don't I get to have a little bit of happiness in this horrible, horrible world? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so and everyone's kind of talking, and it seems like they're going to come to an agreement where some of them stay behind, and some of them go with, and they're going to kind of t- disband. Takeda? T- Takeda, yeah. I think his name was, um, is like a, the younger guy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, the general's kid or whatever. Yeah, he was a major's son, and Kaji's yeah. like, Kaji's kind of, like, Kaji's fine with him, but he's like convinced that Kaji like hates him. Um, and Kaji's like, I'm just trying to do my best here, and you're yeah. kind of annoying. <laughs> but he's definitely like keeping guard on him, and he's like, you should stay here. Yeah. Um, you're never going to be a man if you're just following me and following what I say. And he's like, you should stay here and be a man for this woman that needs you. Um, and, like, it seems like that might be the way to go. And then suddenly Russian and Manchurian soldiers are, like, right outside. And they get ready to fight. And uh, they're, like, squared up, ready to fight. And then suddenly the that woman... Man, I can't remember any names in this trilogy. Yeah. Because there's, like, a thousand characters. She runs out and she's like, no! No, no, no. She's, like, crying. Please don't do this. This will destroy our village. And they surrender themselves. And he's like, Takeda, don't come out here. And he does anyway. Yep. Um, yeah. And then they all get shipped off to be prisoners of war. Yep. To a labor camp. Of course, uh, Kaji's kind of kind of taking the reins. He's kind of like a representative for them, kind of in a sense, like, he ends up trying to garner deals, and he, like, knits a couple of them, like, knapsack, uh, yeah. like, garment, yeah. uh, but... Sweaters. Yes. He's like, it's going to be winter, you're not gonna give us any new clothes. Yeah. We're wearing the sacks. Yeah, Fuck I'm gonna you. wear a sack, and I'm gonna look cool <laughs> while doing it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, so, a bunch of shenanigans... <sighs> we forgot... We forgot to mention a pretty crucial detail that comes back around. For for a while, they were traveling with a couple other soldiers and uh, a soldier and his sister. And the soldier was, like, pretty meek. And they ended up splitting up for a little bit. Uh, and it turns out that the soldiers that went with the sister and the other soldier, like, you know, raped and killed them. So yeah, what like, was... Uh, I... Kirihara... Yeah. I wrote down his name. Yeah. Honestly, the big bad villain, I mean, not the big bad villain of, probably of, like, this one, if there is, like, one humanistic, because it seems like every movie, it seems like there's, like, one character that he has, like, major beef with that it kind of, like, revolves around his, like... Oh, will I kind of seek revenge against this character or not? Yeah, because there's the and he always does. <laughs> Typically, he didn't with the one guy in the first one who was like selling him out and trying to get people to escape so he could get his position of money. Yeah, and at that at the end of that movie, you know, he's like, I was gonna give him a thrashing, but I didn't, and I think that that like obviously is kind of meant to be like. Did I did he do the right yeah. thing and not thrash? But then that's his guy? breaking point, and he does from then on out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, this one, he just... Yeah, he sees him, and he's kind of a higher up in this POW account. Uh, yeah, because he kicks him out of the group when yeah. he finds out what he did. He's like, I'm not going to kill you, but get the fuck out of here. Mm. Should have killed him. Would have saved everybody a whole lot of trouble. Yeah. But yeah, basically, that trio of soldiers that got uh, exiled uh, ended up under the Soviets, and a couple of them got shipped off to... Uh, Siberia! Siberia. Uh, meanwhile, the one stays behind and is basically like, this is my revenge on you, Kaji. Fuck you. Uh, and tries to make his life a living hell. They eat garbage. Uh, the one kid who's like under Kaji's wing is like, has a terrible fever and is yeah. sick. Uh, and the translator is an asshole. Uh, I mean, yeah, and it's like, all these decisions are, like, so sad to watch, but it's also, like, uh, you get it, you know? Mm-hmm. You're in a war, this translator is a, you know, uh, Manchurian, or he's Chinese, and it's like, cool, these soldiers destroyed my family and my home. Yeah. I'm just gonna not translate correctly, and Kaji's, like, begging, he's like, this is, a, you know, and that's it's, that's a it's pretty clear. brutal, so- like, scene. Like, it's obvious that the translator is not, like, even if you didn't know what was being said... I mean, they even don't give subtitles uh, for that, like, final stretch. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's obvious that it's, like, based off the body language. He's like, this isn't what I'm... He'll talk for, like, a minute, and the translator will be like, he said... You're stupid and ugly. Yeah, you're ridiculous and stupid. And the guy's like, what? He's like, yeah, oh, so he thinks he fucked your mom last night, no? Yeah, and it's just like... Yeah, so it's stuff like that, and then it's just... Yeah, it's really hard to watch. It's just super sad. But... Yeah, so... He ends up getting sent off to another railroad or something again. Doing more labor. And he's, like, away for a month. Comes back. uh, And he basically... He had kind of tried to appeal to the uh, one guy's humanity. the His enemy. The guy who assaulted him. Yeah, he's like, please take care of... Takeda, or yeah, his just name, while I'm gone, and he comes back, and the guy's dead. Yeah, so, and the, everyone's like, oh, yeah, no, he caught him scrounging for garbage, and then beat the shit out of him, put him on the train duty, and uh, by the time he was done with it, we carried his body to the uh, the nurse building. I can't think of the... Infirmary? So, infirmary. Carried him to the infirmary, limp and covered in shit, and by the time we got there, it was too late. But they also had to twist. The yeah, they also had to twist the knife by saying, "Yeah," by informing Kaji. I don't know if I'm picking up well. By informing Kaji that uh, he had been like saying, like speaking out his name, like Kaji, calling out for Kaji when he was dying. And it's like. That's sad. Yeah. Especially because he had beaten his fever. And it's like... Ugh. that That's one point that they bring up a lot in the third film, where it's like, we've gotten this far. We can't die. And then just people start dying. And it's yeah. like... Ugh. And then he's like, after that, he's like, I'm breaking out tonight. Mm-hmm. And uh, before he does that, he kills the guy. Be- uh, he beats him with a chain. And, throws and then him throws in the him in the shit water. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> um... <laughs> And then he runs off into the snow. Yeah. And he's wandering and wandering for a long time. And he has, like, this internal monologue, like, I'm coming. And as soon as that, as soon as he started that, I'm like, oh, no. Um, And he's just, like, saying to Michiko, he's like, without you, I would have given up a long time ago. And I'm on my way home. I'm going to see you again. Mm -hmm. And then he's, like... It's so cold and he's so tired and he seems to be having delusions of seeing her. He's like, oh, Michiko, I love you so much. I've missed you. Mm -hmm. And then he falls to the ground and the snow covers his body and he dies. And it zooms out over his body. And I'm going to be honest, that final shot is maybe the most harrowing thing I've, like, ever seen. (laughs) Yeah, it's pretty sad because it's like... There's, like, a quote from uh, Jeff uh, Mangum about, uh, you know, in the aeroplane over the sea that I think kind of... I feel kind of similarly about this, Mm -hmm. uh, where he's like, 
he, he was talking about his experience with the diary of Anne Frank. He's like, you basically like read this diary, like the most personal connection you could have with someone. And then it just ends with, oh yeah, they died and were thrown into a body pit somewhere. And that's it. Yeah. And it's like such, cause it's like you travel with this character for 10 hours or nine and a half, whatever it is. And it's, and you really just yeah. hope. For the best, you know, and you see them constantly lose faith in their own humanity and humanity in general and then start to kind of claw their way back up. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, you, you see that's like the last time they saw their wife was in a gross storage house mm-hmm. laying on a bale of hay or something like that. Like, yeah. That's the last time. And then... That was, like, two years ago or some shit. Yeah, he says it's been, like... uh, I think it's two years since he went to that camp, so maybe, like, probably, like, a year and a half since they saw each other. I think he said it had been, like, 700-something days since he had last... uh, Since they had last been together. It's like... Yeah. Man. Yeah, it's... I I finished it, and I just kind of sat in the darkness. Because I finished it, like, 2 a.m., and I just kind of sat in the darkness for, like, 20 minutes. And then just kind of... Crawled my way to bed because my legs still broke. <laughs> my foot still broke. Yeah. And I just laid there. I'm like, I'm going to sleep. And then the next day I was just thinking about it all day. I was just thinking about that final shot. Yeah. No, it's... Yeah. Uh, and then I was like, I I think this might be the best movie I've ever seen. Yeah. <laughs> I like. Um, it, I'm, I think I'm right there with you. Uh, yeah. Whether you think of it as, like, if you think of it as three separate movies, then I'd probably put the third one as my favorite movie. I might put it as my favorite movie of all time the next time I make a list. Mm. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think... As a trilogy, or as, like, one unit, it's, like, incredible. Mm-hmm. It's astounding. Yeah, I would... See, it's hard, because it's, like, it's segmented into, like, three movies, but, like... Also, I consider, like, scenes from a marriage a movie, and that's, like, four or five. It's five yeah. parts. And then also as the cut, the TV, or the movie cut of it that I have not seen. Yeah, I because it's three hours long. They cut, like, two hours yeah. of content. And it's like, well, I can't, I can't have that. I need every scene from that marriage, but, uh... Yeah, this this was fucking. This is like it. I I, I I say I've said it before that I'm like I think this is the best thing we watched on the podcast, but I'm just like at this point I'm like I think this is the best thing I've ever seen. Yeah, <laughs> it's like well, what the fuck. Yeah, this was fucking phenomenal. Yeah, like I I'm just kind of at a loss. And I also thought it kind of like it. flew by for me. Like each of the three hour run times was like yeah, I was kind of expecting going into this. I was like I. Like I, I don't, I didn't dislike uh, Satan Tango, but like, but it's a much like slower movie. But this yeah. one's like, constantly like, things are happening, you know? Like, yeah, no, like it, it flies by, especially if you just watch it in like the three hour chunks, because then it's just like. Fuck. And what's also interesting is I don't think a terrible way to watch it would be the different parts. Like watching yeah. it as six parts, like hour and a half movies, I think would also work. Oh, yeah. because they're. Their segment. I'm like, this could work as six movies. It could work as three movies, or it could work as one movie. <laughs> yeah, it it works no matter how you look at it. Because I mean, they're all like segmented, and they've got their like themes that they go for. Yeah. Like, usually the first half and the second half pretty different. Yeah. It's not like you're watching the same movie, except you are. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it I. Yeah, this is fucking phenomenal because it's just like, like I was saying, there's so much, so many different like characters who present different points of view, and I mean, it's exploring just like all the fucking philosophies from like post World War Two with like, I mean, obviously kind of analyzing like what it's like to be in a fucking country where like all your peers are just like in this fascist like totalitarian regime that you kind of just get sucked into and not to say that like it i mean obviously it's a very complex kind of thing but 
And it gets into like, oh, you know, are you just following orders or is it like more complicated than that? Do you still have to make these decisions? You do. You have to make those decisions. It is imperative that you make those decisions, but otherwise you get fucking totalitarian or totalitarian regimes. So it's like, a, yeah. Uh, but yeah, this, this is a fucking experience. Like, I just don't know what else to really like say about it. Cause it's so big and broad and well, uh, I'm still processed. Honestly, not it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen before. Literally. Yeah. Like it blows every, I mean, movie I've seen out of the water, but also, like, anything I've seen that's, like, anti-war. Yeah. Like, and yeah. like I mean, Like, the closest anti-war movie I've seen is, like, Paths of Glory. Mm. Um, but I'm just like, holy shit. And, like, we've watched anti-war movies on the podcast. We watched The Beast, which is a great movie. But, like, in John comparison Johnny got his gun. Yeah. In comparison to this, it's like, what the fuck? Yeah. It's doo caca. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. And it's just like, but it's also like so draining of a movie, like emotionally and yes. mentally and spiritually. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, man, I wish I could save Kaji. I did, yeah. I because despite all of his faults, like he tries he desperately, tries, yeah. and it's like, I wish he had survived. I wish. Michiko survived, because I, based off the little context clues, it doesn't sound like she would have been in too good of a spot either. Uh, yeah. And it's just like, these characters don't deserve this. They were thrown into this. Yeah. And it's just like. But it's like, and he says, he says in like a letter or something, it's like, this is, this is my punishment for having that like year of loveliness with you while we were, you know, lording over a prisoner of war camp. Like, mm-hmm. And he realized he's like, I didn't do enough, you know? But the thing is, like, I don't know, because that entire time he was like a zombie. He was very involved in his work and trying. Like, it's not like through most of the movie, it's like he comes home and it's like, <laughs> tee like, yeah. he was but like, he was still in a place that was like secure and like, well, like, and he didn't save them. So like in his mind, it's like, you know, yeah, I could have done more, and pr- he probably could have, you probably know, probably could have, yeah. But he did, he did give a lot. And yeah. try- Kaji is, we've had so many great characters like that we've talked about on the show recently. With, like, anti-war stuff. Like, mm-hmm. in Gundam, like, yeah. Camille Badon. And I was like, Camille Badon and, like, Char are both so interesting as characters. I think Kaji is another one. It's, like, such a compelling character. Mm-hmm. One of the greats. Yeah, yeah. probably, like, the greatest Masaki character. Masaki Kobayashi. Put the film that maybe. maybe, yeah. Masaki Kobayashi would have loved Gundam. He probably saw Gundam. <laughs> Gundam came out 15 years after. Yeah, this probably. Movie. Unless he, unless he's one of those, Tomino guys. probably loved this movie. Yeah, unless he's one of those who is so involved with his own work that he doesn't watch other. Yeah, he's like, I only play tennis. <laughs> Maybe he's one of those directors who's like, I'm gonna watch anime to cool off and then watch Scunt. <laughs> he's like, huh? Well, I want to kill myself. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I give this a ten. I assume yeah. because you said that. Yeah. It's tens across yeah, the board. Yeah, holy shit. Nothing quite like it. Yeah, no, definitely not. And I, like I was saying earlier, I think that this should be mandatory watching for everybody. It's, it's, it's yeah. I think it's important, and I think it... But it's also just like a great... It's not just important, like, from a historical standpoint, which it is important, but it's also, like, a master class of filmmaking. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, watch this movie. Yeah, yeah I've, I, I, please. It's insanely good. Unless you're, like, extremely squeamish and... Because this yeah. movie's uh, rough. Yeah. Like, it's it'll drag you through the... You'll... I mean, it, its intention is to take you through the hardships that Kaji has to go through throughout. And, I mean, even as just an audience member, it's exhausting. So, it's like... Yep. But... It's unlike anything, so... Yeah. Um, 
What are we watching next week? Do you have a pick? Do I have a pick? Do we want to do, do we want to roll? Well, I I wasn't quite sure whose pick it was supposed to be this week. I was going to suggest those other two that you were talking about. So, because uh, yeah, uh, it's like oh, I really want to watch more from this director now. Okay. We can do that. Um, I'm down if you are. That's uh, the other two I mentioned were Quite On, which is a horror anthology movie he did, or like I don't even know if it's horror, but it's like about ghosts, you know. Mm. Um, and then Samurai Rebellion. I want to do those two. Sounds good to me. Um, yeah, Quite On's like three hours. <laughs> Duly noted. But Samurai Rebellion is only two. So. Okay. Cool. Let's do that. More Kobayashi! I think he's the best filmmaker ever. Um, I'm gonna be like, Perhaps, uh, yeah. Uh, we'll see. But if he keeps, you know, there's four movies now that are given tens. Yeah, I've only. Oh, uh, well. If you count these three in Harakiri. I don't know what you gave Harakiri. I don't remember what I gave Harakiri, but I think I might. It was probably like a nine or probably. something. Yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Thanks for watching. Yep. We'll see you next time for more Masaki Kobayashi.